Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this amazing passage of scripture. Thank you that uh, though it was written thousands of years ago, it has so much to say to us today. Thank you that you are the God who speaks. And we pray that you would speak to us now, speak to us personally, into our own lives, into our family lives, into um, where you've called us to be, but also speak to us as a church. Speak um, to us about how we can make a difference in this city. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, it is great to see you. We're in the second of our vision series today, and um, we're looking at um, the whole ways as a church that we can fulfill the vision that God's given to us. Our vision is to see Shadwell and East London transformed by Jesus. And we want to do that through making disciples, it's encouraging each other to follow Jesus, by transforming our communities, and that's what I want to spend a bit of time on today, and by planting churches. And I talked a little bit about that last week. God's called us to um, redig wells in this place and in other places around East London. And um, by the grace of God, we've been planting churches, which is very exciting. And we're going to continue to do that. But um, God has called us here in St. Paul's to transform the communities around us, the ones that we find ourselves in. And this talk I'm calling Restoring the City. Last week it was about redigging wells. Next week we're looking at rebuilding the walls. Today, restoring the city. God has called us as the people of God not to shirk away from getting involved in society and in our cities and in the kind of um, the the day to day life of our cities, but not to run away from them, but to engage with them, to engage with some of the issues and challenges so that we can be a blessing. Jeremiah, speaking the words of God, says, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, if the city prospers, you too will prosper. Um, As I was kind of thinking about this talk, my mind was taken back to a report that I was um, sent by a friend of ours who at that stage worked in the Centre for Social Justice and now another friend uh, from this congregation um, now runs that um, uh, centre. And it's it's a a policy think tank. Um, It has conservative um, party roots, but it's been um, kind of widely acknowledged as something which is challenging actually every party's views on things and every one of our views on things. And it's very much saying we want justice and mercy to be at the center of um, what we're about as a country. We want to be a people in our prosperity um, who are compassionate and kind, actually seeking just what this um, passage of scripture is seeking. And so um, as I was looking at that, the... um, there are some, I just want to read out the conclusion of that report. If you um, Google Breakthrough London, that's a London specific report, and just goes into some of the, um, I, I guess, the discontinuities between this being a, an amazing city that we live in, but also behind the scenes, under the surface, some of the major issues that actually we need to um, take responsibility for um, as a city as well. And this is the conclusion. London is not only the thriving capital of UK culture and commerce, but is emerging as perhaps the world capital of the 21st century. However, its considerable domestic achievements and international prestige will mean little if they come at the expense of a lost generation. While the most affluent of London's young have access to the city's seemingly, seemingly limitless opportunities, nearly half are raised in poverty and have experienced family breakdown. For these young people, the poverty they live in is not simply economic. They suffer a poverty of aspiration and opportunity, resulting from the failure of society to mend the social breakdown surrounding them. It is unthinkable that one of the world's wealthiest cities might leave so many behind. So I think that is something which every party would want to say yes to. And they're working away at how to achieve that. But actually the answers really can only be found in God. It is God's love and compassion that takes us beyond the walls of our own selfishness and our own lives 
to actually make a difference in these communities. I think it's an inspiring passage, this one in Jeremiah. I want to kind of dive into it. Um, but just a little bit of background. Verse 4 um, says, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So the, the, the kind of background to this passage is that the people of Israel had turned away from God so many times. He'd, um, God had raised up prophets to say, Don't do this. Turn back to me. Um, If you don't turn back to me, I will judge you and carry you off into exile. And this is the result. They are now in exile. God has allowed um, foreign kings to invade the land and carry the people of God to another place. But there were prophets amongst them who were saying, um, God's going to bring us back really quickly. And Jeremiah, one of the things he's saying here is no. God has, it's part of God's purpose that you go into exile. You serve your time there, the 70 years. But while you're there... I want you to actually stay and make a difference in that place. It ties into a a picture um, of the church um, that is described as exiles in a foreign land. We're described as being citizens of heaven who are journeying through our world at the moment, waiting to go home to heaven, to a renewed heaven and a renewed earth at the end of all things. And so, as Christians, we sometimes feel that, don't we? We, we feel um, this is not as it should be and this is not quite home. And that's true. But God has called us to almost be part of that kingdom process of bringing the future into the present and saying we want to see some of those things that we'll experience in heaven now. And that's what we're going to unpack a bit um, today. So the first thing I want to um, look at is um, that we should invest ourselves in the city. This is not um, about investing money in the stock markets. It's about investing ourselves in this city. How do we do that? Well, first of all, we, uh, we should plan to stay. So Jeremiah says in verse 5, build houses and settle down. You know, we live in a mobile world where relationships orientate around networks and not so much around geography. But the problem with that is that it leads to dislocation. And actually one of the great challenges for our society is to be rooted, to get to know our neighbours, to start thinking not just about the networks that um, we're part of, which is part of modern day life, but actually our geographical places, our locations um, where we are. Because when we don't, it just leads to loneliness. So many people are lonely in this city because they're not connected into other networks and the geographical um, relationships have broken down. We don't know our neighbours. So if you, but if you choose to stay in a place, like Jeremiah is encouraging here, build houses, settle down. When we choose to stay in a place, when we choose to serve our neighbours, make friends um, uh, beyond our age and stage of life, that's much more about networks, but actually our neighbours are probably not the same as us. When we get to know them, the community becomes richer. They begin to encounter God's love in a completely different way. It becomes deeper, more profound, more supportive. These are the things that God is calling us to. That's what it means to settle down, I think. And that's what more than four is about in this community. It's so easy to just, oh, try this church, then try another one, try another one, and flit around. Actually, it's when we say, I'm going to give this a go. It's when we actually say, I'm going to serve and give this community a go. When I, I'm going to join a connect group and give that a go and actually say, I'm going to commit myself to these people. That's when things begin to change. And actually, in our experience as a church, many people have moved to Shadwell. That was part of our story when we first started eight and a half years ago. Was Actually, there are lots of people in East London already, but certainly 20 of the team of 100 moved house to come and live in Shadwell. Many other people since then have just said, I want to move into Shadwell. We've got a list of people um, right now who say, actually, if, there's an, if the house comes up in Shadwell, we want to move into it so that we can share it with other people in this church and begin to get to know our neighbours to make a difference. If that's you, if you've got a house that um, you have in Shadwell and you've got a spare room, let us know so we can advertise and let people know that they, so they can move in. We've got literally people queuing up to move into Shadwell. Not everyone is doing that, but actually that's what God has stirred up in this community. Second thing he says is make it beautiful. Plant gardens. 
plant gardens. I don't know if you've noticed on King David Lane, so if you go towards the DLR here, they've planted some trees and they've remodeled the pavement. And do you know something? It, it is really beautiful. Every time you go past, it, it, it makes it feel good because there's so much concrete around. When you plant trees in a beautiful way, it changes the atmosphere. This road is one of the most ugly roads in London, and it's busy, and it's, it's, I think it's almost anti-kingdom, the way it, it's so impersonal, it's, put, it's divided the, the neighbourhood um, uh, and the community, and it just doesn't look very nice. Wouldn't it be amazing to beautify the highway at Christmas time, and, and with Christmas trees or something like that, or even in our patch, so we can say, look, it can be done. But um, planting gardens is, about, is again, a part, part of this settling down, beautifying the city, we can take a responsibility. That's why, I mean, they don't look very good at the moment. We try to put kind of window boxes on our, uh, on our house on the highway just to say, look, they're going to die pretty quick because of the traffic and the pollution, but we're going to make a difference. We're going to make a stand. We're going to plant this garden. And we're going to try and beautify our bit. It's a picture of taking responsibility for our city. Third thing here is grow its businesses. It says, eat what these gardens produce. Uh, This isn't an advert for buy British. Um, It's not that we hate foreigners or hate foreign food or anything like that. But actually, there is something about going local. And I think there's a theological point about it. Actually, I think life is, um, uh, with supermarkets and that kind of thing, that's fine. I'm not speaking against that. We do that ourselves, and that's that's good. Think about what supermarkets you're going to, and think, think about how they look after their staff and so on. But there are opportunities to bless your local um, business, because if that business has your um, it takes your business, that will thrive and that will help that community to become more bonded and grow together. So don't do all your shopping in big supermarkets. Do some of it locally. Go to your local um, corner shop and get to know the um, you know the staff in there. Bless them, encourage them, smile at them. Most of the time, people are rude to them. Be nice to them. Um, if businesses locally prosper. This area will prosper. Um, the economy begins to prosper. Um, economic prospects um, get, get uh, increase. Um, employment begins to increase. Um, with greater, uh, more businesses, more employment, competition increases. So we actually benefit from that. So it's actually a benefit to, to do these things. You get a better deal. So choose, you know, get involved in your local community, not just um, the kind of the network communities in terms of um, buying stuff. Fourthly, it says, get married and make babies. Number six, verse six, marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters a marriage so that they too will have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Now, I'm not going to go into a population control. That's a different point. But the point here is that um, cities actually encourage us to get married later. Um, we get worried about how our children are going to um, grow up. And there is a sense of actually having to go against the flow of where our society is at. And this encouragement to meet people, get married, have children, is something that is going to make a huge difference in the city. Statistically, there are very few middle-class families who live in Tower Hamlets because housing is so unaffordable for that size of house. We need to do something in terms of working together with the council to create more affordable housing for families who are not just um, supported through social services. That's where most of the families who are, have older children are, statistically. We can change that by getting together with other churches and saying, no, let's reverse this trend. Let's actually encourage each other to stay in the city as our children grow. Let's choose to make a difference. Um, let's you know, that have these families. And building family life makes such a difference. Um, One of the challenges with young people is the fear of commitment. Um, You know, I'm looking for that perfect wife or that perfect husband. Um, Or relationships are, they stay superficial, so I never get beyond um, that, uh, you know, I'm longing to get married, but I can't break through that, uh, the, the fears associated with that commitment. We need as a church community to be saying, let's change that. Let's create opportunities for people to get to know each other. Those who are married, invite single people to, um, into your families to um, enjoy um, the children, get to know, you know, to take away the fears of, um, you know, relating to children. Um, have host parties with lots and lots of single people so that they can uh, meet each other and get to know each other and fall in love with each other and get married and um, make babies. It enriches 
community and it enriches life uh, in the city. So probably said enough about that, uh, but go for it. Go for it. Um, get married and make babies. Uh, fifth thing under this point is to serve the broken. Verse 7, also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. You know, when people, when we see people and places not prospering, God touches our hearts. Our hearts feel a compulsion to do something about it. And often we don't know what to do. And then when we don't know what to do, we, we focus on something else and the busyness of our lives means that we don't dwell on these things. But actually, if we're seeking the peace and prosperity of this, of this place, of Tower Hamlets, of, of East London, then actually it calls for dwelling on that. It calls for allowing God to stir our hearts um, with his compassion, his love, so that, that can make, uh, so that we begin to do something about it. We begin to respond to what God is doing. And that's why we're involved in, um, in these ministries here, things like night shelter, debt advice, um, street pastors, uh, you know, um, dads and sons football, kind of um, helping um, uh, the, the um, Bangladeshi community, kind of me- meshing their community together more. Um, they're little things that we can do. They're, they're almost, in one sense, they don't do very much when you look at the whole picture, but they're signs of what is possible. And as a community, they speak of what this community is about because of what, what we focus on, which is about God's love, the love of God shed abroad in our hearts, making a difference. One by one, relationship by relationship. Serve the broken. I want to encourage you, get involved in one of these ministries. That night shelter thing, it, we did it as a family. We cooked one, one of the nights. And I was quite worried about how our children would handle it. But actually, they absolutely loved it. And they, they actually said to Louis this morning, can we do that again, looking at that video? Help them, you know, cook a meal or, um, or help stay overnight. You know, that seems scary, but actually um, those who have done it would say, oh, it's amazing and it's actually much easier than you think. Or cook breakfast for them. Um, sixthly, under this, pray for blessing. Pray to the Lord for the city because if it prospers, you too will prosper. We need to pray. We need to make that a priority, not just for praying for our own needs, but praying for the city. Praying for the work of this church in the city. You know something, I think we've known seasons where things get really, really challenging um, in our church as we try and engage with these things in, in the community. And I, I think at the moment we're in one of those seasons where things are challenging, things are difficult. And that changes when people pray. We need to pray for God's anointing. That's the, the pouring out of his spirit. We need to pray for protection. We need to pray uh, that God would prosper the relationships inside and outside this church, that we would have favour in the local community and that we would be able to do um, far more than we ask or imagine, that we would be able to do impossible things because we have a God who is a God of the impossible. Pray for God's blessing. So under that first point of invest in the city, so many different ways we can invest. This is just uh, unpacking some of those things from um, chapter 29. Secondly, um, Live out your calling. Live out your calling. There are so many ways that um, God calls us to get involved in, in the community, in um, the workplace, in our own homes. And um, in verse 8, God says this, Don't be deceived. Don't listen to the dreams you encourage these prophets to have. They're prophesying lies. I haven't sent them. You know, there were some who were saying, Get, you know, leave. Don't engage with the city. Go back home to where you were before. And the encouragement here is don't listen to them. Don't listen to that voice saying, escape. It's much easier. You know, I think of um, uh, uh, Louis, who was brought up in the countryside in Surrey. Actually, being in the, in the city, um, both when we were in West London and here, is a great challenge for her. But actually, God has called her, and she senses and knows that calling, to go against the flow of what she feels to stay here. I remember Amanda, when she, God called her to come and be with this um, church and this staff team, um, uh, a few years ago and um, God spoke to her directly about knowing that you know in her background where she was brought up in the countryside as well about you know those and I talked to her about it often but fields came into it as a big way and uh, that God knew that he was asking her to let go of fields and that kind of experience of being in that open space to come and be here and God knows the challenges um, some people thrive in that 
Some people are city people, but some people don't. And yet he still calls some of those people to come and engage um, in the city. So don't give up, I think I'm really saying, um, in the challenging places. Tower Hamlets is a challenging place. We're in um, the third most deprived borough in the nation. Tower Hamlets, Hackney and Newham are the three most poor boroughs in the country. And we see that all over the place. Don't run away. And God has called each one of you into a place in this city, whether it's um, uh, being a parent at home, looking, you know, choosing not to go back to work, but choosing to say, I'm going to invest in my children so that they can be brought up well in this place. It might be um, uh, you know, teachers, nurses, lawyers, bankers, um, civil servants. There are so many different professions that are represented here. Find, know your calling and link it to what God is calling you to do, to see it as a bigger picture. God has called me to be a blessing to this city and I'm going to be the best dot, 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 dot that I can be, the best families worker, the best nurse, the best mother, the best teacher, lawyer. You, know, you fill in the gaps. That, I'm going to do that for the glory of God, to make this city prosper, to play my, my part in that. So, um, uh, one of the, uh, when I, whenever I've kind of talked about this kind of area, one person always springs to mind as someone who is passionate about living in Tower Hamlets. And I'd love you to please welcome Jonathan Moles, who um, is, uh, I'm going to interview. Jonathan, um, I'm going to get, just grab this microphone here as well so you can hold it. There we go, you can hold that. Come, come you. Here. Um, so, Jonathan, first of all, tell us about yourself, your family, who you are, what you do, all that kind of thing. So, uh, yes, I, Rick is right. I'm one of those people who's basically ticked all the boxes um, that he uh, noted today. I, uh, and I'm a journalist. Um, I work at the Financial Times, uh, where I write about entrepreneurs. Um, and uh, I'm married to Helen. Uh, we actually met in East London, in Hackney, um, in a church. Uh, up there, uh, St. Luke's. We went away to New York because I got a job transfer out there. We, we spent five years out there, but I missed London. And I missed the East End in particular because it's actually the most exciting place you can live on the planet. <laughs> so tell us um, why, tell us a bit more about that. Why have you chosen to live in Tower Hamlets? Well, um, I, so I grew up. I grew up in countryside of a sort called Woodford Green, um, which is on northeast London. It's in Epping Forest. They all think they live in a village out there, and they all say they live in Essex, but they don't. Um, uh, and it's full of people who moved out of the East End, and they know the old East End um, of a world that was despairing. Uh, and and a trick, I mean, the reason there were no middle class people in the East End because it was a working class place for a long time, and it was going down. And something changed in the East End. Big towers over there are, are a clue. Um, but it's, um, it's transforming as a place. And I think God is bringing us, um, uh, bringing people here. And tell us, you know, you, had, you were telling me just before about three things that you thought, actually, these are things which are fantastic about being in this place. Yeah, Rick, Rick asked me to sort of summarise it briefly because he knows I might go on. Um, and so I went three Fs, fun, family and fellowship. Um, and uh, fun because this is an incredible place. I mean, we've got all the shortage hipsters up there. We have, we have lots going on as well. And we live, we live in villages as well. I mean, we, we have a sense of Shabwell as a village. We live in the village of um, Limehouse uh, next to the village of Stepney. Um, and there's a village of Bow and others. We have a, a village farm uh, near us where you get very good flat white coffee um, and uh, fresh eggs uh, if you want to go to buy local. Um, and uh, and um, so it's, it's, an, it's an amazing place that's both everything you can do and, and a real human uh, place uh, that you can be. It's family because it's a place of families as well. There are families moving in here. Um, at the FT, we deal with figures a lot. We tell you tipping points of things of moving forward and tell you how what you thought was true is may not be. In, um, things are changing. Things are changing here. This borough is the only borough in the country that also became younger in the last 10 years. 
Um, and a lot of that's because of people settling here and having families um, and, uh, and, and bringing them up here. And they're bringing them up here because our schools are going through a transformation. Um, our, uh, our, all the schools in, in Tower Hamlets are either good or outstanding. They, and that's because they've gone through a transformation. They've gone from some of them being some of the worst schools and they transformed to being some of the best schools and the results are showing it. But the, um, our three boys are in, uh, in a primary school on our street. Uh, they video conference with kids in Korea. Uh, the top year school holiday was to Italy last year. They, they do amazing things They're in the primary schools as well. Um, and we're, we're, we're growing more schools around because we, we're growing more families uh, in the area. And there's, there's an amazing chance for uh, if you want to bring up a family. Again, there's, it's an amazing place uh, to do that. And finally, fellowship, uh, because well, for us, it's an amazing church. And uh, when we came back from New York, we were praying about uh, finding a church, and we've gone around. There are some other incredible churches around East London. We're very lucky, lots of different denominations. Um, but this is an amazingly special place, and, and, uh, and I think there's a lot of, as Rick says, sort of bringing God's voice is about a, a voice of its hope, um, and it's, it's doing the best you can. And, and this church brings hope and, and it encourages us to do uh, the best we can. And, and it does. And, and we wish to do the best we can to be part of it. That's amazing. And Jonathan, tell us what difference you think um, we as Christians can make in to Hamlets in the city. Um, so, uh, again, Rick asked me to be It's a loaded question. Three, three things. Firstly, most importantly, love the place you live. And I think it's back to this... The scripture here and I think that's what God calls us to do it's very easy we've all come from somewhere um, somewhere else we're all sort of in a sense sort of migrants um, into here uh, and we have a sense of where we were born but God's brought us here we're here now we're living in our houses now let's let's love this place uh, now uh, secondly and the way we can do that random acts of kindness um, I get picked up by people because I I Slightly obsessively, I, if I see something litter on the floor, I pick it up and I chuck it in the bin. But it's it's amazing, little things like that. People come up to me and go, "Thanks, how do you do?" You know, and and it's the easiest thing in the world to do. Uh, smile at people in the street. Smile, say thank you to the bus conductor, the bus driver. Um, easy little things you can do, and you make an enormous difference to people's lives. Um, and then finally, just go out there and grab it and do it. Go to Stepney City Farm and drink their flat white. Go to, go to the uh, uh, London Fields Lido and swim outdoors. And go to the um, Half Moon Theatre with your kids because it's an amazing kids' theatre just off the commercial road. Jonathan, thank you very much indeed. That's great. <laughs> so find your calling and immerse yourself in it in the city. Final thing. Find your purpose. Finding your purposes for God is, is more about um, underneath your calling. What is God specifically calling you to do? And um, in verse 10, I think, well, I just want to unpack these last few verses. First of all, we need to trust God's promises. This is what the Lord says. I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. So whilst the exiles felt away from home and God had promised them that he was going to take them back and they were longing for that, he said, look, I, you can trust me. You can trust me. Trust my promises. There are apparently 3,753 promises in the Bible. Someone counted them. Uh, it might be 52 rather than 53. Uh, 3,753. And the point is that God is faithful and you can test him in this. You can trust him and see how his faithfulness works out in practice. He is a faithful God. When he promises things, they are fulfilled. So when he says the biggest, you know, when he says to, um, in the, the book of Malachi, the, the promise of the people, I will be with you. It's a simple promise. But they experienced the presence of God. They knew that to be true. That's something that God, um, Jesus says to the disciples, I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. He's with us in the most challenging situations, in the most um, trying circumstances. When um, everything seems to be going wrong, he is with us. And we can begin, when we turn to him and trust him, 
We begin to be aware of his presence with us. Um, I read uh, about this flight instructor and this, um, this pastor, actually, who was learning to fly. Something I would love to do, although this story slightly scares me about it. Um, and uh, this pastor, first lesson, um, is with the flight instructor, and they're up in the air. And then the instructor says to him, I want you to, they're quite happy, I want you to put the, the plane into uh, a dive and just head straight down. And... Um, uh, he, he thought everything was going to be fine, so he puts it into a dive. The first thing that happened was the engine stalled, and then uh, the, the plane began to spin. And um, uh, the, the, uh, this pastor just thought, well, I'm, I, I can't do anything. And he was just waiting for the instructor to do something. But the instructor was like this. And he, he just thought, what are you doing? You know what I'm doing? And he just went like this. And eventually he just thought, well, I've got to do something because... Um, you know, this plane's going to crash. So he, he kind of manages to um, get it out and kind of pull it back and um, it comes out of the spin. He begins to fly prop, fly normally. And when the, he's got kind of a bit stable, he, the pastor turns to the, this instructor and says, what are you doing? You, we almost died. You know, we could have crashed. And the instructor um, said this to him very calmly. He said, there's no position you can get this airplane into that I cannot get you out of. If you want to learn to fly, go up there again and do it again. <laughs> so, <laughs> he took a deep breath and <laughs> pulled the stick back and went up again. And I think, um, you know, God, I think, wants to say something like this to you. There is no situation you can get, it, it, get yourself into that I cannot get you out of. If you trust me, you'll be all right. It's a challenge to each one of us to trust God with the day-to-day, -day, with those decisions about staying in the city, about investing yourself in the city, about our children, about our jobs, about what he's calling us to do in this church. Second thing we see here is trusting his timing. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, God's timing is perfect. And sometimes we need to remind ourselves that waiting is okay. We are there might be things, I think there are things in your lives right now where you're just going, I can't wait any longer. I've got to do something. And you're tempted to make it happen yourself. And God is saying, wait. Wait. Might be something you're longing for. Something you're longing for for your children and for your, um, in your own life. Sometimes waiting is the right thing. God's timing is perfect. Trust his timing. And thirdly, trust his purposes. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. God has a purpose for each one of you in this church community. There is no discontinuity between what you're called to as a person in this city, whether it's you know, a professional calling or a, um, a, f um, a community or family calling. There's no discontinuity be between that and the calling you have in this church. We are a church that is about releasing one another into what God has called for us, called us to do and to be. And so whatever happens in this community whether it's inside this place or some of the ministries outside. Whatever we do as a community is a sign to the world of what God is and who, you know, who he is and what he does. The way we conduct our relationships with one another is a sign to the world. The way we have compassion for the city is a sign to the world. The way we worship is a sign to the world that this is what God calls us to be and to do. And so um, this vision as a church, we want to transform our communities, to play our part in seeing our communities transformed by the love and power of Jesus. And so one of, this, one of the things in this vision series, I, I'm asking you is to say, are you in? Are you in on this vision? Are you, uh, do you want to play your part in this community so that we can be a blessing to this city? Got some cards um, at the back, I think, where um, it, it just says, I'm in. 
I'm in. It's a very simple statement. Just put your name to it and say, I'm in. Love you to, um, to sign that perhaps today. I'm here to be part of redigging wells, to see the flow of God's life again in this place and in this part of the city. I'm in to see the city restored. I'm in to see the walls of the church, not in a, uh, you know, to be rebuilt, the structures of the church. They're strong, not so that they exclude, but so they include. Just three quick things, three ways to be involved. One is to, um, to belong to a connect group. It makes so much difference. The connect groups are the life and soul of the church. And it's, um, there are some people who can't join a connect group. And if that's you, we want to find a way that you can belong. But that, the main way is through connect groups. The second thing is serving. Serving in one of the ministries. Getting involved in one of those social transformation ministries or um, something in the life of the church here. I just heard someone saying today, I'd love to help with the, with the sound. And that's fantastic. I think we need more um, people who are just great singers um, to come and help um, be involved in the, in the worship ministry. We want um, people who are just prepared behind the scenes to make things happen. We're looking for a new um, uh, coordinator on the staff team uh, who'd, who'd be part of releasing the church into, um, into making it happen more effectively. Serve in a ministry. And the third way, a uh, fourth way, third way, belong, serve, and give. Would you give to the church's vision? If you're not already giving, if you do give, that's fantastic. We're encouraging people to give by direct debit. And there's a form at the back where you can just, it's a very simple form, you can fill it in. That helps us as a church to plan uh, what we do. Um, just so you know, our turnover is a few pounds short of £400,000, which is a huge amount of money. And um, 85% of that's already been raised for this year in terms of, you know, for committed giving and so on. So 15% still to raise. So £60,000, we're trying to encourage new people in the church or people who haven't started giving yet to just to start to give. And um, we're just so excited about the way God um, has developed and, you know, grown a generosity in the hearts and minds of people here. And I'd love to encourage you, please think about giving to the church. There are direct debit forms at the back. Whether it's a small amount or a large amount, that regular planned giving is about, it, it, it's actually, you know, we will benefit from that. But the most important thing is actually what it's doing to you. It's encouraging you to be generous. And what's behind that is actually a recognition that actually what I have doesn't belong to me, it belongs to God. And if I give part of what I have been given by God back to him, particularly the first bit of that, the, you know, the income comes in, I'm going to put aside some of that money straight away and give it back to God and then live on what remains. That begins to change the way we live. We find actually our finances begin to get straight and sorted because we're planning and thinking much more about um, our income and our expenditure. So please do give and please do um, take a form if you don't already give by direct debit and think about that. Um, uh, in a moment, I'm going to encourage you to fill in a form. I'm in and we'll do our offering. And so you might like to give a one-off gift to that offering. You might like to start a direct debit. Certainly the thing I'd love you to do is to say, I'm in um, with this vision, to pray for it, to try and belong to it, to serve within it and to give to it. Um, uh, and so that's one end to this talk. 